I mean, we're also getting into questions of, of meaning and purpose here, which is often considered kind of beyond the, the purview of what science is all about. I mean, scientists traditionally, and they're trying to understand how things work. But is that a mistake? I mean, is there a responsibility for scientists to take on some of these questions to figure out how these ideas apply to the larger world to make it better? Well, my position is absolutely, you know, we do. And the problem is that there are different ways. Scientists are just like everybody else. We have different opinions about things, right? So a lot of my colleagues would say, what is this guy talking about? You know, we should just, uh, we live in the, what, what I call the Copernican narrative, which is basically the idea that the more we know about the universe, the less important we become. And I think that narrative has to change because it's really the opposite. The more we know about the universe, the more relevant and more important we become because we are these molecular machines that are capable of self-awareness. And as far as we know, there aren't any other ones like that. And so that gives us a new moral uh, directive, you know, imperative really, to kind of understand that we actually do have a role in this planet right now. But not everybody will agree with me because, you know, they're thinking about the multiverse and there are many other universes out there or let's colonize Mars, you know, and I'm thinking, no, look at this place. No, we don't even understand our biome, right? I mean, how are we going to colonize Mars without all the biomes that we carry with us, yeah, yeah. right? It's uh, there's, some, there's also something there about the internationalism of science, you know, that, um, the scientific cooperation, you know, a good example would be the Cold War, you know, where there's still people managed to forge scientific connections of trust across uh, the Iron Curtain because they had an idea or a vision of something greater that was a common goal for humanity. And so I think very powerfully that science has an obligation to try to maintain that code of ethics among itself, to, to not be politicized, to not let themselves be politicized as scientists, even though dependent on tax dollars and all the rest of it, that there is another kind of loyalty to an ideal which is much more international and is much more long scale. Um, you know, again, back, come back to my, old field, my own field in medicine, you know, all the great advances in medicine have been in things like public health, vaccination, not in new chemotherapies and so on, but even just with public health and vaccination and a little more understanding of nutrition, a little more understanding of communicable disease. Over the course of the 20th century, we doubled human life expectancy just in, the, in one century. So human life expectancy increased as much in the 20th century as it did in the previous 8,000 years. And that's just thanks to simple things. Now we think of them as simple. Um, and so that kind of approach to sharing that kind of knowledge can have wonderful, wonderful repercussions for us as a, as a species. I think. I'm assuming you would say as a doctor that you have to have an ethical perspective on what you do. I mean, it's sort of, I, I, I'm guessing it would be impossible not to do that, to practice medicine. Yeah, I think so. And it can be, it can be very distorted, particularly by um, financial uh, questions in the consulting room. You know, I practice medicine in the UK. We have a national health service. It's a very different medical system. The way it's paid for is very different here. And I, and I really cherish, I really like the fact that when I see my patients... I don't need to think about their wallet at all because I'm paid from somewhere else. And they trust me more because they know I'm not going to get paid more if I recommend a certain kind of treatment. And so that's the model that I'm used to. And I really, really appreciate that model. I don't, yeah, I don't see how you can separate an ethical dimension from the practice of medicine. And the, the, the way in which people manage to maintain their love for the profession or get burnout is a lot to do with when they start to lose the lose sight of, of the value of that, what they're doing, uh, start to um, change the way they behave for different kinds of groups of patients, for example. So I do think we need to qualify this, though, right? I, mean, I think we're all familiar with the phenomenon of people stepping outside their area of expertise and maybe seeming like they have some authority um, because they're, they're very established in one field, right? So celebrities might comment on vaccines, but they're probably not the people you should defer to for your, your best knowledge on vaccines. And I think 
someone can be a, a terrific scientist, but that doesn't mean that they have expertise in policy. It doesn't mean that they have expertise in ethical issues. I think for some of those questions, you want to look to the relevant kinds of expertise. I think a scientist can acquire that kind of expertise, right? So somebody who's a, a, a physicist can acquire a lot of uh, sophisticated philosophical thinking and ethical thinking and so on. But insofar as they're doing that, they're doing ethics or they're doing uh, policy, right? So I do think there's a bit of a danger here of thinking that because many things should be evidence-based and based on science, that scientists should be the ones making these decisions. I think they should only make them to the extent they have the relevant expertise. Absolutely.